Hello, uh, my name is uh, Nikolai Kajanov. I'm a research associate professor at the Gulf Studies Center of Qatar University. Today, I have a pleasure to chair a very interesting panel on Russian foreign policy towards the Middle East. We are basically pursuing two goals. One is to talk and discuss the current state of Russian presence in the Middle East and what it means uh, for Moscow and for the international community in lives of uh, Putin's invasion of Ukraine. And the second one is uh, also to advertise and promote the book that has been recently published uh, with the support of the Center of the International and Regional Studies of Georgetown University, which is titled the same as um, uh, the topic of our today's presentation, Russian Foreign Policy Towards uh, the Middle East, New Trends and Old Traditions. Uh, in the panel today, we have three out of eight authors who contributed their chapters. Um, and uh, this book is uh, aimed, was aimed and is still hope, hopefully aimed to create a comprehensive description of the motives and drivers of Russian foreign policy towards the region. Uh, and let me also introduce the uh, three authors, uh, three contributors um, who participated in this project. Uh, first of all, uh, in order of their speech, um, uh, uh, let me introduce Dr. Mark Katz, who is a professor of government and politics in the George Mason University um, School of uh, Policy and Government, and a non-resident uh, senior fellow at the Atlantic Council. He has been a visiting uh, senior fellow at the Finnish Institute of International Affairs. Fulbright Scholar at the School of Oriental and, Afri and African Studies and a Sir William Laws, Laws Fellow at Durham University. He earned his BA in International Relations from the University of California at Riverside in 1976, MA in International Relations from John Hopkins University School of uh, Advanced International Studies in 1978, and PhD in Poli uh, Political Science from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology in 1982. He is the author of um, lots of articles and studies uh, on uh, Russia's foreign policy towards the Middle East. Uh, and not only, most recently, he is the author of Living Without Losing, The War on Terror After Iraq and Afghanistan, uh, that was published by John Hopkins University uh, Press. Our second guest is uh, Roy Ellison, who is a professor of Russian and Eurasian international relations in the School of Global and Area Studies. Uh, and Director of Russian Eurasian Studies Center in St. Anthony's College at the University of Oxford. Uh, his previous appointments uh, include the head of the Russian Eurasia program at the Royal Institute of International Affairs, Chatham House, and reader in international relations in the London School of uh, Economics. He has published 10 books, single authors and edited, of which the most recent is Russia, the West, and, mil and Military Intervention, published by Oxford University Press. His research focuses on the international relations, foreign and security policies of Russia, Ukraine, Central Asia, and the South Caucasus. Last but not least uh, is um, uh, Leonid Isayev, uh, our third guest, who is an associate professor in the Department for Asian and African Studies in the National Research University, High School of Economics in St. Petersburg. He is also the deputy head of the laboratory for monitoring the risks of social, um, social political destabilization, um, which is based at the High School of Economics, Moscow, and a senior fellow at the Center for Civilizational and Regional Studies in the Institute of African Studies of the Russian Academy of Science. Uh, he has published also numerous monographs and journal articles on uh, both in Russian and English on the Middle Eastern affairs and on Russian foreign policy. Uh, among all, he is a co-author of Syria and Yemen, Unfinished, Unfinished Revolutions, um, that was uh, published in 2013. And his recent uh, monograph was Fight for the Middle East, Regional Actors in the Course of the Middle Eastern Conflict, published in 2019. So as you can see, we have a brilliant plethora of scholars who has a long track experience of uh, following uh, Middle Eastern affairs and Russian foreign policy. Uh, without further ado, I would like to give them the floor to uh, make an initial remarks uh, 
if possible, five minutes each. After that, I will most probably abuse my right as a chairperson to ask my the first round of questions, and then I'll open the floor to the audience. Mark, let me begin with you. Uh, as far as I know and remember, you contributed with a chapter on the uh, continuity and new patterns in Soviet and Russian foreign policy towards the Middle East. So what would you know, now after more than six months since uh, since the book being published it was before the Ukrainian conflict, what would you add to your chapter and what could you say is still important for us to know about the past experience and new trends in Russian foreign policy towards the region? I think that, uh, thank you for that kind introduction, but uh, certainly, you know, I think that uh, what we saw, what I pointed out in the chapter was that, um, you know, uh, one of the main continuities about uh, uh, Soviet era, Cold War era of policy in the Middle East, as well as Putin's, of course, was that uh, both are pursuing a very active policy in the region. But the main difference was that uh, the Soviet Union uh, acted as a revolutionary uh, power and that its uh, efforts to uh, establish good relations with uh, established governments were hindered by the fear that uh, uh, they were also trying to bring about the downfall of those governments. And that was not just true with pro-Western regimes, but even certain uh, the pro-Soviet ones that sometimes Moscow, or at least they feared that Moscow was trying to replace the existing leadership with uh, someone better, at least from Moscow's point of view. Uh, what I think that what, what Putin has done and done very successfully is that he's established good relations with all governments in the region, including every single American ally in the Middle East now has good relations with with Russia uh, that in fact Russia you know under Putin in the Middle East anyway is uh, more of a status quo power and certainly the Russians um, have uh, portrayed the United States at least after uh, the Arab uprisings of 2011 as acting more as a revolutionary power bringing about the downfall of of, of existing governments uh, which, of course, uh, they don't like uh, as well, and that uh, the Russians are, are, are with those governments uh, on this issue. And I think that, you know, obviously we, we wrote these uh, chapters before the uh, uh, war in Ukraine began, but what I think is, is fascinating is that uh, certainly um, Putin's policy has paid off. In other words, that... Uh, you know, it's not surprising that uh, you know anti-Western regimes, whether in Iran or in Syria, have been more supportive of Russia. But that uh, every single um, pro-Western regime has either tried to distance itself uh, from the conflict, they play an even-handed role, or they have um, been collaborating with uh, Russia in various respects uh, that, that the West has been unhappy about. Uh, and so I guess in that sense, um, you know, we have seen uh, sort of the, the constant, the, the, the payoff, if you will, of Putin's uh, policy toward the Middle East, uh, we've seen take place uh, uh, since the war in, in Ukraine, that the, the uh, unlike uh, European nations, other Western nations, uh, they're not proving to be uh, partners uh, with the U.S. and other Western states uh, with regard to the Ukraine, that they're, they're uh, pursuing a very different policy. And so it's not a question of whether one uh, approves of this. It's a question of, you know, has, has, has Russian policy been successful? And I think that in many respects, uh, Putin has been far more successful than the Soviets ever were in the Middle East. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, but uh, from your point of view, um, what's the main secret of Putin's success? So right now, for instance, after the uh, recent voting in OPEC Plus uh, for the decrease in production, uh, the Western media, as well as the, 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 the policymakers, analysts, started speaking about uh, the emerging of uh, an alliance between Russia and suddenly the, the Gulf states. Uh, do we really have an alliance? And uh, if we do, 
uh, what's behind all of this? So is it the Putin pragmatism or it's more interest of the original players to, to deal with Russia nowadays? I think it's a combination. Certainly, uh, Putin's pragmatism comes into place. But I think that, that uh, as, as you mentioned, one has to look at the, the interests of the local actors, uh, certainly in the Gulf. And I think that uh, you know what we what we do know is that for many of them, most of them, the, the what they regard as the primary threat uh, is Iran. Uh, I think that what we have seen is that uh, you know the Iranians are certainly uh, using this war as an opportunity to uh, get closer to the Russians. The Russians can even have a degree of dependence on Iran. Uh, and I think that that uh, part of the, the response of the, the Arab Gulf states is uh, this, they're not happy about this, but but is to engage Russia even more. In other words, give Russia uh, good reasons to to continue to work with them and not with Iran against them. And I think with regard to the OPEC Plus agreement. That there's simply a um, you know a, a convergence of interest between uh, the Saudis in particular uh, and the Russians. Both, after all, are oil exporters. Both uh, want higher prices rather than lower prices, uh, and that having higher prices, you know, reducing production simply uh, serves their their interests. I believe that what what the U.S. expected was that you know in in a time of uh, crisis when uh, you know the, uh, the U.S., which perceives itself as having been a you know a strong ally of Saudi Arabia and the Gulf, uh, and then that they you know, would would expect you know some assistance uh, in, in this matter. When when the U.S. didn't receive it, it was um, it was very surprised and hence calling for uh, reevaluation of these relationships. On the other hand, I think that that what we have seen also is that. Uh, uh, there are cooler heads in Washington, which, which understand that is, you know, whether one one likes what the Saudis in particular have done or not, that the um, the U.S. really has little choice but to work with them. I think this is what the Saudis understand, uh, and and that's some of those. I think you know, one has to look at the interests of the the local actors in particular. Uh, in part to explain uh, Russia's successful diplomacy. It's successful because um, there are actors in the Middle East who, who want to work with Russia. Thank you. Uh, Roy, to you, uh, you contributed to the volume with the chapter uh, on Russian legal and normative claims for the intervention in the Syrian conflict since 2015. Uh, looking at the Syrian issue, what can we tell now about its importance for Moscow? Thank you, Nikolai. I'm delighted to take part in this discussion. Um, I'll, I'll talk a, a bit more broadly about how where Syria lies in, in Russian policy and the opportunities or otherwise it represents now. And then I'll refer also to the, the issues around norms and law uh, in, a, in a few minutes. Uh, so I think it's it's timely because it's now a full decade, uh, 10 years since Russia became seriously engaged in supporting the Assad administration back in 2002. And we can consider over that time now, review Russian objectives and achievements. Uh, well, I think if you, in, 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 in the broader sense, I think we could say that Russia's gains are more substantial than it expected in 2012. Of course, that was before it had committed itself to a military role, uh, but probably less than Moscow hoped in the period after that military intervention, after the relative success of that military intervention from by about, say, 2016, 2018. And I think now from 2022, the question uh, you, you referred to this at the beginning, we may pose is, to what extent have Russian failures in the Ukraine campaign so far and the new polarization of relations with the West around Ukraine influenced Russian positions and prospects in Syria? Now, this is an open-ended question, uh, and I'm going to be slightly more uh, pessimistic about Russia's opportunities, let's say, uh, from a Moscow perspective, than Mark. Um, so, I mean, first, I think strategic, uh, strategic gains and possibilities. 
uh, there was talk uh, back some years that Russia really had, was intent to create a new strategic, uh, is it is a new, is in a sense, a new strate strategic um, imprint uh, in the theater in the Middle East, uh, trying to restore something of the image of the, the past. And this was about power projection, uh, that it might also link to policy uh, further to, to the Red Sea and on to the Indian Ocean and so on. There was talk about establishing additional bases, uh, for example, in Sudan. None of this has really developed very much. The Taratus base has certainly been upgraded. Uh, but then you have to consider what USAT is. Uh, Russia had uh, clearly been thinking of developing a corridor between the Black Sea and the East Mediterranean, and Syria was very important for that, from that perspective. It was an integrated zone, a strategic zone. It's closed off now, of course, because of the Turkish Straits are closed under the Montreal Convention. Uh, the flagship of the Black Sea, which was steaming off the Syrian coast, assisting operations beforehand, is now sunk. Um, and that, that notion of uh, Russia as a permanent naval presence in the East Mediterranean looks now a bit distant and, a, a, and, and rather ambitious. Um, then if we consider geopolitical uh, relations, uh, I think the, the way Mark described it, I, I agree that uh, Russian relations with neighboring states, um, all those around the Syrian conflict were involved in it in various ways, uh, were determined by their interest in influencing Russian policy as a major actor in the region. And it reflected a perception, I would say, that Russia would remain a, a, a longer term uh, regional geostrategic presence. And there's a wish to as well balance Western states in the region. So Russia could be seen as a balancer. Uh, and that was all based on an acceptance of Russia as a, as a military power and as a power with a substantial structural influence in the international system. And we have to question whether that perception has taken something of a dent and how that will influence the commitment of these countries to retain that degree of that, that those, those close relations with Russia. And it's uncertain at the moment. I think the balancing uh, uh, temptation is still there, but Russia may be seen as less able to uh, counterbalance other influences, particularly, of course, economically. Um, there's, a, there's an issue, uh, especially about Iran. Um, Mark referred to this. And I, I, it seems that Russia has become even more reliant on Iran and its Syria policy. Uh, and this is despite the fact that earlier, I mean, back in 2018 already, Russia had indicated that it hoped that Iranian forces would eventually be, with, be withdrawn along with other other foreign forces in the country. Uh, and there are other differences between Russia and Iran over Syria policy that surfaced at various times. I mean, clearly Iran has, has had a, a larger a, a role. It's, it's actual the presence and the, and the role of the Hezbollah have gone rather further than Russia might have wished. Um, but I think Russia just has to swallow uh, its concerns up here, suppress these concerns because they've become more reliant on Iran, of course, because of the confrontation uh, with the West and military alignment with Ukraine. Um, just in the last week, there has been uh, much about the Iranian uh, uh, drone um, supply uh, to, to Russia to assist uh, in Ukrainian operations. Uh, and one has to consider whether that kind of developing Russian-Iranian relationship will stretch uh, the Russian-Israeli uh, relationship well, you know, one, one step too far. Uh, I mean, so far, it seems a deconfliction uh, a mechanism that uh, Russia set up with Israel to uh, avoid escalation over Syria uh, is still working. Um, Israel has been striking targets in, in Syria, uh, and it hasn't led to further escalation. But I, I, it seems to me that strains on this relationship are increasing, um, and it is to watch. Uh, and then there's a question of Turkey. Uh, this is a large um, subject uh, and uh, one which is, has many paradoxes about it, but I think it's clear that there is conflict, significant conflict has been uh, at the moment suppressed uh, over the extent of control and operations in the Idlib province. Uh, I mean, this has involved over the, over the past years in, in, in deaths of, uh, considerable deaths of so, um, Turkish combat forces, 
uh, a lot of rhetoric, bad rhetoric going back between Erdogan and Putin particularly. Right, it's been managed so far, but it, it, we should consider this in the context of other uh, areas of um, regional difference between Russia, Russia and, and, and Turkey from, from, from Libya through to uh, the Karabakh conflict. Now, my book chapter concerned uh, the legal and normative case Russia presented uh, to support its intervention in Syria in 2015. And uh, on one hand, in terms of traditional international legal understandings, Russia had a pretty good case uh, saying that it was invited by the Assad administration that was sort of recognized as the, uh, the legitimate authority uh, in the United Nations uh, the, 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 in Syria. Um, but, and and, and this, this, this meant that Russia could be, Russia be supporting the incumbent regime there, feeling that you know, it had the weight of that kind of traditional sovereignty-oriented view of international law behind it. But in the case of Ukraine, of course, it's seeking to overthrow the regime rather than to sustain it. Um, and whereas Russia has insisted on uh, support for state sovereignty uh, in the Syrian case, it's been trying to tear apart the sovereign state of Ukraine. Uh, in Syria, Russia derived certain legitimacy also from its military success simply in a, in, a, in a kind of realist way, countries respond to that, How, however brutally it was done. But in Ukraine, it rather the reverse of the case. I mean, Russia uh, appears to be a state with, without a uh, very effective uh, advanced military technologies when it comes to a significant military conflict, uh, without perhaps the desirable weapon systems that Russia is trying to sell. And, and the Syrian conflict uh, was partly presented by Russia as a, a selling point for Russian arms, the ar Russian arms industry. So Russia was exposed with obsolescent equipment and conventional capabilities. So that's a part, I think, of perhaps the growing reappraisal of, of Russia by regional states looking at it in a very hard to way, thinking about what can Russia bring to the table. Um, I mean, finally, on my, my chapter also uh, had considerable emphasis on uh, the whole issue of international humanitarian law and human rights uh, abuses in, in Syria, which were on a, uh, a major scale, very egregious abuses. Uh, and here we find this is an element of commonality, of course, with, with Russian operations in Ukraine. Uh, many similar tactics, um, uh, terrorizing civilian populations, um, but also you find the use of non-state actors uh, to try and bolster Russian military effectiveness, um, such as the Wagner uh, group or uh, Chechen forces to some extent in, in both conflicts. Um, and you know, beyond those also, the, some, some other uh, institutions of state uh, which Russia has deployed again, as in the Syria conflict, uh, such as the, uh, the uh, Orthodox, Russian Orthodox Church, um, uh, particularly to, to try and uh, gather legitimacy in, in Russian domestic Opinion. So there's some parallels of this kind between the conflicts, but I, I think that most of the parallels are ones that don't um, uh, encourage a, uh, a, a, a view of the Syri Russia's Syrian accomplishments, it don't, it don't add to it, they, they subtract from it. Um, so in conclusion, I think sort of overall, Russia's become rather more exposed in Syria, rather than than being able to build on its regional presence there, at least build to the extent that it hoped over the last few years. And we might say, I mean, I'd, I'd hear sort of conjecture that uh, this effort of power projection beyond its Eurasian and European perimeters may be the last ambition of this kind for a decade or more, uh, as Russian leaders narrow their horizons on, on salvaging what they can from the military chaos they've Unleash much closer to home. So uh, I think that might be the big, the big ticket issue here, the, the, the result now, um, the way in which the Ukraine conflict has a knock-on effect on its ambitions um, in Syria. Um, um, it's not to say, I'll say as, as a final point, it's not to say that Russia doesn't have very significant influence in other ways and means in the wider Middle East and the Gulf. Uh, Mark referred, of course, to the uh, its, its, its energy uh, potential. It, it, diplomacy and potential that's that really operates in a somewhat different sphere to what i've been discussing
thank you very much. Um, uh, if I also may abuse my position as a chairperson and ask this question. So uh, this fact that Russia might be overstretched right now in its involvement in Syria, does it mean that we might see it actually uh, pulling back or trying to descale its presence on the ground in this country? I, I don't think we'll see very much because the the commitment that Russia has on the ground is, is, is fairly uh, small scale. Uh, and because there isn't really active fighting going on, uh, it doesn't need much more. Uh, the, the aircraft there, Russia still has a very uh, considerable unused military aircraft potential that and Russia doesn't really want to risk the use of too much more in, in Ukraine. Uh, and then there's a question of just um, uh, protection, force protection uh, around bases and so forth, and, 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 the, and the naval uh, the naval facility at Tartus. Um, so I think not, but uh, it, it's it's more trying to leverage the relationship with Iran so that Russia doesn't have to take up much any additional security load uh, and think not thinking about expanding this uh, much further. Uh, uh, and I think also, as, as I mentioned, that the naval side of it will be more, uh, more, more limited and uh, linked simply to directly to uh, to Syria rather than thinking about a larger East Mediterranean eff effective presence. Thank you. Leonid, uh, now to you, last but not least. Uh, <laughs> uh, you contributed uh, to the book with a chapter on domestic drivers of uh, um, Russian's foreign policy towards the Middle East. Right now, Ukraine and uh, the overall Putin's uh, endeavors in the near and far abroad uh, diverted our attention from this factor. But in reality, how important it is actually for our understanding of the Russian presence in the Middle East? And uh, before you started answering, let me also encourage the audience to write their questions in Q&A bar. I'm looking forward to receiving your questions. Thank you. Great, great. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Nikolai. Uh, let me let me start with uh, with some compliments to 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 uh, all of those people who were who was who were uh, involved in this project. I guess uh, this is uh, the comprehensive analysis of. Uh, on the Russian foreign policy, and uh, it's a pleasure for me to uh, to to be part of uh, this book. And from my point of view, this this work is important uh, because we try to analyze the Russian foreign policy from the different angles. And speaking about my role in this project and in this book, so I try to pay more attention to the domestic factors and identify. The, the internal roots of the Russian uh, foreign policy in the Middle East uh, and the Russian so-called Russian return uh, to the Middle East uh, at the second part of 2010s. So my main idea was to show how uh, internal factors uh, affect on the Russian return to the Middle East, and I believe uh, Putin's popularity uh, after 2011 uh, mostly based on the uh, foreign policy uh, agenda. So this is a kind of uh, rally around the flag. And uh, according to the uh, polls uh, in Russia, we can identify so-called wave of, of waves of uh, um, um, uh, mobilization uh, around the uh, around the Kremlin. So we 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 can identify it to 2008 when uh, Russia uh, started its military operation in. Uh, and war in Georgia. So the same situation 2014 uh, after Russian annexation to Crimea, and actually the same in 2015 after Russian invasion to 
to to to Sirius. So since uh, uh, since uh, uh, Russian regime force based on the economic and political uh, problems uh, at the start of 2010s, uh, uh, Putin pay more and more attention to the uh, to the to, to the foreign policy, especially in the Middle East and uh, Russian. Uh, pivot to the uh, to the east in general as a part of this uh, process. So, in other words, I would like to say uh, uh, it's impossible to imagine uh, uh, Russian invasion to Syria, uh, Russian return to the Middle East uh, at the second part of 2010s uh, without uh, protests in Bolotne Square, without. Uh, annexation of Crimea without Russian invasion to Donbass in 2014, and uh, actually without, without the deep crisis in relations between, between West and Russia, uh, actually between Russia and its main uh, foreign partners during the two and a half decades after the Soviet Union collapse. So from this point of view, uh, Russian 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 return to the Middle East uh, uh, mostly is a fourth step, but not the essential or natural desire of uh, Russian regime to strengthen relations with uh, with the region. So in my chapter, I try to show uh, this connection between between the uh, domestic and internal processes in in Russia and uh, and Russian activization in Middle East. Uh, uh, at the second part of uh, 2010s. So speaking about the current situation, we we can see the 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 the, the actually the uh, the same trend. Uh, Middle East uh, uh, plays more more and more important role for uh, for 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 Russia due to the uh, Russian war in war in Ukraine. And uh, we we can uh, identify another uh, another way for step of mobilization of activization of the Russian uh, Middle Eastern policy, Russian foreign policy in the Middle East. Uh, and yeah, this is this is again this is uh, this is a result of uh, uh, of the internal situation. This is a result of uh, uh, of uh, of uh, the Russian policy towards Ukraine, and this is the result of another um, another another period of uh, of crisis between Russia and the West. So it's clear, absolutely clear, that uh, then Middle Eastern countries now 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 plays a crucial role for for the Russian foreign policy in general. Uh, so that's why Russia is so so. Uh, so care about uh, its relations with Turkey and Iran, and with uh, with the Gulf region. So that's uh, that's uh, that was my idea, and I guess uh, I will stop at this point. And again, thank you. Uh, I would like to thank uh, everyone who 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 was involved in this book. It was a real pleasure to to be a part of this. Project. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Leonid. Um, just one question to you. Uh, so, as you mentioned, uh, the uh, Russian propaganda machine was quite um, tempted for the last five, seven years to use the Middle Eastern agenda to shape public opinion inside uh, Russia. We remember the, how Putin was declaring four or five times the victory in Syria and withdrawal just to, has he, to shore up his base of support. To what extent the Middle Eastern agenda uh, can be used these days uh, to strengthen Putin's positions, given that now all attention of the domestic audience is definitely concentrated on Ukraine and what's happening in Russia's relations with the West? In other words, uh, does the Middle East still matter for Russian propaganda? Uh, yeah, sure. It's uh, it's extremely uh, it's extremely uh, important for Middle East. It's extremely important for Russian propaganda. Uh, 
uh, Middle East in particular and uh, Asian and African countries uh, in general. And uh, we can see that uh, Russia, Russian propaganda uh, and Russian officials uh, pay more and more attention to the uh, position of uh, the Asian and African countries uh, on, the, uh, uh, on the Ukrainian crisis and on the global agenda uh, in general. So it's very important for Russia that uh, that Middle Eastern countries uh, are a part of so-called non-alignment movement uh, now. So they don't do not want to be a part of this Ukrainian crisis. So they do not want to uh, to to uh, to be a part of the Western bloc. At the same time. Uh, they do not want to be uh, to, to, to be on the Russian side, but at the same time, Russian 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 uh, officials uh, interpret this uh, uh, situation uh, quite clear. They try to show that uh, this non-alignment position, or neutral position of of the Middle Eastern uh, countries, means that uh, they are uh, support uh, support. Uh, Russia and have some sympathies uh, towards uh, uh, towards Russia and Russian foreign policy. So yeah, that's that's. I mean, Middle East uh, is important for Russia because because the neutral position of uh, of the Middle Eastern uh, countries towards the Ukrainian crisis uh, um, helps Russian propaganda. Uh, to show that uh, Russia is not alone, so that uh, many countries in the world do not want to be a part of uh, uh, of the Western and Russian bloc. So, in this, in, in, in from this point of view, yeah, it's uh, it's quite important. Uh, I guess that's why we we uh, hear quite often uh, from the Russian officials and from the Russian mass media that uh, th this again this uh, uh, cold war discourse yep that uh, that uh, again we we are with the so-called third world with with asian africa and uh, from the other hand we have uh, the western bloc so from this point of view we try to again to underline uh, our uh, let's say, uh, role uh, in the world history at the current stage. Thank you very much. We started receiving questions from the audience. So let me take the first round. Um, in most cases, the questions are addressed to all speakers. So um, the first question is about uh, Putin's threat to use uh, nuclear weapons. Um, apart from a general question of to what extent actually Putin is ready to use it, um, uh, the uh, key interest is what kind of impact these threats, uh, real or let's say, or let's say, invented by Putin deliberately as part of his propaganda, uh, can affect the behavior of the Middle Eastern players and both Russia's relations with them. So most obviously, we also. I mean, the audience is also interested in Russian-Iranian cooperation because we heard quite a lot of um, stories on, on Russia being less uh, interested in the revival of the GCPOA since recently. Uh, the second question is about China. Uh, it's increasing aspirations uh, like BRI project, energy deals, uh, and uh, the others in the region. Uh, do they alter Russian foreign policy towards the Middle East in any significant way? Or, and if you allow to add from my side, uh, will we see any cooperation between Russia and China in the Middle East? Uh, the third question is, uh, what is likely to affect Russia's alliance with some countries of the GCC in the current moment? Because we were speaking about certain strengthening relations between uh, Russia and GCC. I personally wouldn't call it an alliance, but I don't want to impose my um uh, ideas on the audience and on the presenters so um it would be great if you could share with us your opinion uh why 
don't we start uh, answering this question in the opposite order? So, Leonid, can you share your opinion first? Mm -hmm. uh, yep. Uh, uh, first of all, speaking about the uh, the nuclear weapon, I do not believe that uh, that Putin Putin is ready to 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 use the nuclear weapon uh, 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 right now i guess this is uh, uh, yeah probably he will for sure he will use it uh, uh, as uh, i don't know as a oh, maybe last leverage uh, uh, or in case of uh, the direct threat uh to him but i'm not sure that uh, that that now uh, now russia is ready uh to do that uh, otherwise i guess uh, russia will uh, will lose even the neutral uh neutral uh, position of many countries uh, uh, in in Asia and Africa, and uh, for sure in the Middle East, because for the Middle East, it's, as far as I understand, it's extremely important uh, question. Uh, so I'm not sure that uh, Putin Putin will use it uh, use it uh, at the uh, at the at the current stage of Ukrainian crisis. So speaking about. Uh, uh, actually, I'm 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 not a specialist on 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 China, but I do not believe in in Russian China uh, cooperation in the Middle East. Uh, I I I never see uh, this kind of uh, cooperation before, and uh, I guess Russians are interested in that, but I'm not sure that uh, uh, Chinese is interest are interested in that. Uh, kind of cooperation. Uh, for example, as far as I see, uh, the 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 African case. Uh, so yep, Russia Russia is interesting to cooperate with China in Africa, but uh, but uh, actually from 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 Chinese point of view, uh, they are not interested in this kind of cooperation. I guess we will have the same situation in, 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 in the Middle East. So I guess China played its own uh, game in the region and uh, China does not need uh, uh, Russia here, uh, even during uh, the, 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 the current, uh, current uh, uh, situation and, uh, uh, and clashes between China and US and Russia in the West. Um, actually, speaking about the uh, Russian uh, uh, Russian GCC uh, uh, GCC relations uh, and what is uh, likely to affect Russia's alliance with pragmatism. We uh, first of all pragmatism. Uh, we see this kind of uh, uh, cooperation between Russia, uh, Russia and the GCC countries. Uh, so they are still interested in cooperation, uh, continuing cooperation with uh, with Russia, despite the uh, Ukrainian crisis and pressure from the West. And also, I guess, uh, quite important role plays. Uh, uh, the the mm, there's some kind of misunderstanding between uh, or clashes between uh, some GCC countries and uh, and the United States. So this is also an important uh, driver for or factor for improving Russian GCC relations. But from from the other from from the other hand, I guess that. Uh, that uh, we uh, we we do not still have uh, any uh, any any real cooperation between Russia and GCC. So uh, uh, I, I I guess 
if, for example, relations between GCC and United States uh, uh, will become better in the future, uh, I guess uh, Russian, Russian, Russian relations with GCC uh, will be quite uh, uh, more problem pro problematic. Uh, Thank you, uh, I guess I guess I will stop uh, here because the next question mostly devoted to Mark, and yep. And due to the time, yeah. Um, thank you, Leonid. Uh, Roy, uh, oh, sorry. Yes, Roy, to you. Um, thank you. And the question on the, the effects of these nuclear threats and nuclear coercion is interesting. Uh, my, I, I suspect that this would be received really with uh, some consternation. Uh, by Middle Eastern uh, governments and leaders um, for various reasons. I mean, one would be in developing their relations with Russia, uh, Russia has been projecting itself and seeking to, this is the narrative that Russia is a responsible global power. It's a United Nations Security Council member vested with authority to try and maintain and preserve international peace and security of which the nuclear order is a key element of that. So this kind of loose language about the use of nuclear weapons completely undermines that. And the position that Russia seeks to adopt and through which other countries can associate with in their relations with Russia. Um, secondly, uh, and this is a very sensitive matter, we have to keep in mind that Israel is a nuclear power and the whole issue of the usability of nuclear weapons, if, you know, if, if, if they, the Russian narrative frames them as more usable, that has very adverse implications for other Middle Eastern states that do not have nuclear weapons and do not wish these to enter into the frame of relations really uh, with Israel, although they know that you, Israel has this as, as a last resort. Um, so I think that those are two specific issues, and that, and also in general, it, it, it undermines the uh, the whole non-proliferation treaty regime, the efforts to try by by Gulf states uh, to constrain uh, Iranian nuclear uh, nuclear um, military nuclear development. Um, so uh, so I, I, I think consternation um, with China. Uh, I agree with it, Leonid. I, I think cooperation is not really uh, easy uh, between Russia and China in this theatre. Uh, China has the economic means and resources, the investment resources. Russia absolutely does not. Uh, it might in, in, in certain areas in the energy field. Uh, it has made significant investments in some niche projects in the wider area, such as in civil nuclear energy in Egypt. But I think that it's, it's very stretched, clearly now, will continue to be. Uh, and China is a, a, a country which is expanding its global reach. And so, uh, for example, I think Russia would look not so happily at the idea of Iran finally conceding to China a naval base something that has been in the background uh, rumored or just, you know, discussed. Uh, Russia would, 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 would see that as, as, as being in some ways as competing. Um, so I, I think it's a wary sort of co uh, attempt to try and align interests, but ones where there, there are some tensions potentially. Um, on the GCCR, I, this is really Mark's authority, you know, his authority here. So I, I just mentioned a couple of things that come to mind. I mean, one is that uh, the effect of the, the, the Ukraine conflict, um, I mentioned the display of Russian arms. So, I mean, for example, Saudi Arabia has suggested it might wish to uh, buy a more significant package of Russian arms. I, I, I think that that will be rethought. Um, knowing anyway, I mean, the Saudi arms relationship with the United States is of a completely different order. Uh, I think it will remain so. Um, uh, although there may be a, a rethinking in general, I think, among Middle Eastern countries about the, the role, the kinds of weapons that are relevant. I mean, for example, drones. Drones are clearly 
uh, of great interest, um, whereas some of the sort of conventional armor um, that has been sold uh, may be less valued. Um, and the, the other thing is, it, as far as uh, Gulf investments in matters such as Arctic energy development, whether it's Qatari or, um, or, or Saudi, uh, well, I mean, first, it, it, the Russian ability to do that has been set back by the you know, sanctions effect on deep sea drilling technologies and matters like that. The concerns about secondary sanctions and so on, it just, I think, makes it more difficult uh, to wrap up deals or engage in deals and take them forward with Russia uh, for, with Gulf, for Gulf financing, which we seem to be financially uh, a good prospect. So there are difficulties around that that arise from the, 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 the broader polarization between Russia and the West. Thank you very much. Uh, Mark, before coming to you, um, I just noticed that we have a specific question, let's say, about Iran, which was addressed to you by one of our guests. Um, he says that uh, in, some, in some of your recent comments, uh, you were saying that Russia may now be doing less to restrain Iran's nuclear program. So that's exactly the question I, I asked before it. Uh, so could you elaborate more about this? And in general, uh, do you have a perception that the Russian moves in the Middle East might push the region, uh, and probably not only the region, towards the, the, the greater major war that might end up against the Russian interests? Thank you very much. Yes, uh, this is question was from Cameron Johnson. I have it here on my screen about um, you know uh, the Russians uh, uh, doing less to restrain the Iranian nuclear program. What 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 strikes me is that obviously in the past you know, Russia, like other countries, doesn't want to see the you know expansion of nuclear powers and thus was supportive of the uh, Iranian nuclear accord. But I think also. Uh, the Russian support of the Iranian nuclear accord in the past because Iran wanted uh, an Iranian nuclear accord. I remember certainly talking with the late uh, Georgi Mirsky about this, that, there was, that Russia was not in a position to uh, to work against the Iranian nuclear accord if uh, when, when Iran itself wanted to have this because Iran would have simply pursued it anyway. But now that the Iranians uh, are, are less interested, it appears, uh, in, in resuming this uh, after the Trump administration withdrawal and the uh, constipated negotiations uh, with the Biden administration, uh, certainly with Russia becoming uh, dependent on Iranian drone supplies, Russia is not going to punish the Iranians for not re-entering the agreement. And I think that also um, that uh, I think the Russian attitude is that uh, uh, if Iran acquires nuclear weapons, uh, how is this different from Pakistan having done so? That it was that, that the world is simply going to have to adjust. And I think that there is something uh, in this attitude. I think that, that uh, you know, part of the reason I think why the Iranians if they do acquire nuclear weapons, uh, it, it would be to avoid an attack, uh, whether from Israel or from the United States. Uh, at least this, I think, would be would be the logic of, of doing so. And I think that you know we still haven't seen a uh, nuclear exchange between you know nuclear powers yet. Whether, whether if the number expands, that this might. Uh, might change. I, I think that um, what we will see is if Iran does acquire nuclear weapons, then I think we'll very quickly see Turkey uh, uh, do so, Saudi Arabia try to, maybe Egypt. Um, uh, but uh, it, it doesn't necessarily, it, it means a tenser Middle East. It doesn't necessarily mean a Middle East that goes to war because, you know, as elsewhere, then the stakes are just that much, much higher. Uh, hopefully, uh, we won't uh, uh, be able to, to to test my my uh, theorization here by seeing any of this happen. But I I think that the uh, short answer is I think that that um, you know, Russia is not going to uh, to punish Iran if if it acquires these weapons. Um, I would just also like to take note uh, of uh, Kiara Lavati. Uh, she asked about you know how the Russia's war in Ukraine 
uh, is going to affect uh, Middle East policy over the next decade. And of course, this is this is an imponderable because uh, it all depends on, on how the war goes. Um, I would just like to point out that, uh, as I have in, in other point, uh, writings that I have had, that the 1990s, when there was a Soviet sort of pullback from the Middle East, this isn't the only time that Russia has pulled back from the Middle East. You know, Catherine the Great had a forward policy there in the late 18th century. Uh, Russia pulled back on this uh, during its preoccupation with Napoleonic Wars. Uh, Nicholas I, in particular, pursued a very uh, aggressive policy toward the Ottoman Empire, um, was quite successful in the Middle East until uh, he engaged uh, in the uh, Crimean War. Then there was this pullback. Then, of course, uh, I think also, you know, by, by the late 19th century, early uh, 20th century, um, Nicholas the first, uh, Nicholas, Nicholas the second had pursued a successful forward policy. And during World War One, as badly as the Russians did against the Germans, Russian, uh, the Russians did pretty well uh, against the Ottoman Empire. Uh, but of course, this all collapsed with the Russian Revolution. Uh, and, and similarly, you know, with the, uh, in other words, that, that, that Moscow's Cold War influence uh, in, you know, expansion in the Middle East and then its pullback in the 1990s, uh, it was not you know, something unique. And so it strikes me that if we see the war on Ukraine end badly for Russia, then I would think that we would see a, a lesser Russian um, uh, ability to, to uh, project a forward policy. But in other words, the, the, the success or failure of Russia's policy in the Middle East in the past, it has seems to be, for the most part, has less to do with with uh, the the actual success or failure of the Middle East policy, and more to do with Russia's larger position in the world, whether it's you know been uh, on the back foot, whether in Europe or or domestic problems themselves. These have led to pullbacks from the Middle East, not so much any particular failure in the Middle East itself. And so uh, that I think, in other words, if, if 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 the Russians do well in Ukraine, which is hard to imagine at at, at present, then obviously I think we'll see a, you know a, a stronger policy in the Middle East. But I think the more Russia is preoccupied with Ukraine, just the less ability that it's going to have to 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 deal with the Middle East. And certainly, um, and that you know uh, gets me to my. Uh, Fatiha Hijazi's question about about uh, you know is is China going to be able to uh, increase? In what I think is that with with a lot as with a lot of conflicts uh, in the world, the the true winners often tend to be the states that are not involved in conflict, uh, that the ones who who uh, basically are able to 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 pick up the pieces. Certainly, China is one such country, but uh, so far it's not so willing to play a, a security role in the region. This may change uh, if Chinese power increases. Uh, uh, of course, that's a whole separate subject. I think what we're seeing is that Turkey has become a lot more uh, influential, and I think we'll see. In other words, I think that 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 the, the Middle East is going to see a lot of other actors uh, playing roles. And what's also clear is that um, that Middle Eastern actors want external powers to, to be involved. And I think one of the things that I, that I have, would like to argue is that uh, you know, in terms of uh, the Middle East's uh, governments is that they don't really want to, to see Russia fail badly in Ukraine. They may not approve of what it's doing in Ukraine. Uh, uh, but that what they don't want is a return to the 1990s, the 2000s, the 2010s, uh, when America was the principal great power operating, and that it was you know, pushing them toward democratization efforts uh, that they did not want to undertake and which they saw as, as disruptive. Uh, that 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 the you know, Russia's ability to play a role in an alternate great power uh, allows them to resist this because you know the United States has to compete with Russia 
uh, or at least while it's there. And so I think that um, uh, this is this is part of the reason why we have seen Middle Eastern actors, you know, be cooperative with Russia is that that they don't want to go back to a a uh, unipolar uh, era. They they didn't like that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, let me collect another last round of questions. So um, I guess, Lenny, this question goes to you. Um, well, as well as Olga, so welcome to also to, to, to join answering it. How the Ukrainian war is affecting Russian interests in Yemen? And what would be the most preferred outcome of this conflict for Moscow these days? Uh, we also have a question to, to, to all, I guess, is about, um, I guess, Roy, it's even more to you. Uh, it's about uh, Russian capacities to support the Syrian regime militarily. So to what extent uh, the, the Assad regime depends on uh, Russian weapons and how it can suffer from the ongoing uh, conflict in Ukraine. Um, the... Uh, Question, another question that we received from the audience is about sanctions. It's more general. It's asking about um, actually how sanctions are affecting Russia uh, or the West, if we're talking about Russian sanctions. And if you allow me, I'll modify this slightly. How actually sanctions are affecting Russian corporations with the Middle East? That would be probably the most important um, part of the sanction story for us. Um, and the last question that I would like to pick up from the audience, because most of them, they have been already answered, especially about China. Uh, how do you see uh, actually the uh, Ukrainian conflict affecting uh, Russian-Turkish relations? Mark, if you don't mind, I'll ask this question, address this question to you. So this time, well, Roy, if you don't mind, can we start with you? Uh, so taking the question about the effect of the war on the cooperation, military cooperation with Syria, um, well, the main part of Russian contribution to Syrian regime requirements is, to say, is over. It has been done through the large scale, well, it's not, it's not actually a medium scale involvement, uh, but over, sustained over time. Uh, and done with, with uh, great um, focus uh, and, as I said, lack of concern about effects on town, towns and citizens. Um, what Russia uh, may find it difficult to do is to contribute much in the way of personnel. Uh, these aren't really necessary, I, I, I would say. I mean, more trained personnel, trained ground person, military personnel. Um, some security sector support, yes, uh, in kind of internal forces. Uh, there have been some Chechen militias who've been providing security functions, this kind, um, uh, not, not really trained for combat uh, as such. Uh, Russia had at one stage called for a, a so-called uh, a deployment of the collective security treaty organization suggested that Kazakhstan might uh, contribute uh, to that, to which Kazakhstan refused effectively and said that it would only contribute forces to UN uh, peacekeeping. Um, there have been some Armenians that have been deployed in mine clearing and that kind of thing in Syria. Uh, but I, I, so I, I, there's a question of we, beyond that, Russia's not going to be offering free uh, significant military supplies or hardware I mean, to build up Syria as, as, a, mili as a military, uh, uh, as a small military power. That, that, I think, is not going to be really happening. It's not, it, it, and the Syrian regime hasn't got the funds uh, to, to do this. I mean, even in the period before 2015, uh, when it had some interest in that, uh, the funding wasn't simply available there. Uh, to do this, and Russia won't do what the Soviet Union was doing in the up to you know, into the eighties, and that's provide weaponry, uh, heavy discounted or free. Uh, it's not in a position to do that. Um, 
so I, I think it won't affect overall very much uh, the Syrian capacity to maintain the Syrian regime's ability to maintain its positions, as it were. Uh, and Iran uh, will provide, continue to provide on ground and Iranian and Shia Hezbollah militias uh, uh, the kind of support that um, Assad will uh, will still need. Um, so I think that I mean Russian-Turkish relations. I mean I did I, I referred to this. I it, it, it's it's something that has been managed in a in a, in a very interesting way. I mean I, it, 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 they tread on each other's toes. Uh, in, in Italy, it, it's surprising the uh, the intensity of clashes that took place, and yet this could be resolved. Uh, it, it seems that it requires personal meetings. We Putin Erdogan uh, to be able to bring tensions down because uh, that relationship is seen to have many wider contexts to it. And Erdogan is quite reliant on the Russian relationship in that sense. Uh, but uh, they're, they're simply different interests on the ground. Uh, and it, it ties in with uh, uh, Turkish internal uh, concerns about uh, managing and suppressing uh, uh, Kurdish um, militia uh, uh, opposition um, uh, actions, um, which is which is a very ingrained matter, and Erdogan has a lot of support, domestic support for that. Oh, thank, thank you, um, Mark. Uh, can I ask you to be the second in a row to answer? Thank you. Yes. Um, well, you know, the, these questions about, uh, you know, sort of future, you know, Russian Turkish relations, Russian Israeli relations, it seems to me that the, the, the larger question is uh, how long can Putin continue to play this balancing act of opposing, uh, of supporting opposing sides simultaneously? Uh, you know, he's been pretty successful at this, in other words, you know, supporting Iran, but also supporting uh, Israel, uh, working with uh, the Gulf countries, um, despite the fact that, you know, neither side wishes that uh, Russia was interacting with the other. But I think what, you know, Russia has counted on, it's not that uh, whether people like this or not, it's that, uh, A, that uh, Russia, you know, there's if you work with Russia, you can you can get something from it, uh, and B, if you don't, then the risk is that Russia will help the other side even more. And so I think that that's kept uh, people playing this game uh, with Russia. But if because of the uh, exigencies of the war in Ukraine or, uh, or or whatever, that Russia is perceived as being less able to do so then I think that the relationship with Russia um, in other words, becomes less important. And I think that you know, what we might see is, you know, if, um, you know, uh, if, if Russia is seen as being as less able or willing to act in Syria, does this encourage uh, Turkey to be more aggressive? And what's going to stop Turkey from doing so? We've seen that they have become more aggressive uh, you know, with regard to the South Caucasus, uh, the Russians have uh, had to put up with it. And in many respects, this is actually far more dramatic. In other words, that for Turkey to play a role inside the former Soviet Union, I think is even uh, you know, uh, a greater feat than to, to do so in, um, in, in Syria. Um, I think that with the return of Netanyahu to power and his focus on Iran, uh, obviously, he's had good relations with Putin, um, but I, I think that if he thinks that that the Iranians are becoming more active in Syria in ways and that the Russians are, are no longer able to stop them, I think that what we're going to see is the possibility of greater Russian-Iranian uh, confrontation uh, in this, this theater. And what would Russia be able to do uh, if, if this happens? And that's the thing. I think that the um, to the extent that Russia or Putin has played an umpire role in the Middle East, that that the longer the war goes on in Ukraine, the less able um, he may be 
able to do this or, or perceived as able to do this. And I think that that's where we're going to see um, changes in, in how, how useful different Middle Eastern governments find Russia, that they can't use it as a lever against their um, adversary. Therefore, they either they'll turn to someone else or they'll take matters into their own hands. And then the other thing uh, I think that we need to uh, talk about is that, you know, if the, um, you know, obviously we've seen, you know, the Ukrainian grain is getting out to market, but, you know, it, it, is this a, a temporary measure that at some point might, might Russia stop this or, or is it because, you know, Ukrainian farmers simply aren't able to produce as much due to the uh, damage caused by the war? In other words, that, that there's, a, there's a risk that, that the longer the war in Ukraine goes on, that the more um, uh, higher food prices or, or food shortages could affect stability in the Middle East. Certainly, we, we saw in the you know 2011 that uh, trying to raise food prices, uh, food shortages played a role in these Arab uprisings. And so, you know, if this happens, um, you know, uh, that it's not clear that anyone is going to be in a position to to um, to calm the Middle East down, uh, certainly at least not external powers. So th that I think is is the danger uh, that we see with regard to the war in Ukraine uh, as well, that it might just contribute to, to disorder in the Middle East. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Leonid, to you. What's about Yemen and how Russia's interests are there are affected by the Ukrainian war? Three minutes, please. Yes, yes. Uh, I guess uh, I do not see any uh, any uh, 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 serious impact of uh, the Ukrainian war to, to the Yemeni conflict, uh, because the main problem of the Ukrainian conflict and uh, of the Yemeni conflict that this is it is forgotten conflict. Uh, so even before the 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 uh, Russian invasion to to, to Ukraine in 2022, uh, international community did not uh, pay uh, a lot of attention to the Yemeni conflict. At the same time, uh, I would like to say that uh, during the uh, during the last uh, years. Uh, uh before before the uh, war in ukraine and even now russia uh, russia actually uh, have quite 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 uh quite similar position on yemeni conflict with with the other powers so in yemeni conflict actually the good example of uh, of the cooperation uh between between uh, external powers so, uh, but uh, again, I, I, I do not see, I'm, I'm not sure that uh, even now uh, international community will be ready to find the resources to, to, to solve the Yemeni conflict. But uh, yeah, I guess uh, this, is, this, is, uh, this is a huge pro 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 problem which, uh, uh, which mostly uh, uh, Devoted to the limits of uh, 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 leverages in Saudi Arabia uh, to 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 affect on the uh, Yemeni crisis. Uh, so in this case, I do not see any any um, serious connection between 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 uh, Ukrainian crisis and uh, and the future of the Yemeni Ye Ye Yemeni crisis. And still, Yemen, Yemen crisis still, uh, and future of the Yemen is still, uh, still, still very unpredictable. Uh, and uh, yep, yeah, and uh, speaking about the uh, the, um, uh, the 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 question, uh, I will try to combine the the the, the question about sanctions and question about Israel. Uh, so I guess that uh, after the after the uh, uh, Ukrainian crisis and uh, after the 
uh, Ukrainian war and after the sanctions against Russia. Uh, of course, Russia uh, Russia forced to play to 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 cooperate with with the Middle East. So it's no other option for Russia. So that's why uh, Iran, Turkey, Gulf countries, uh, Israel uh, become more and more important uh, uh, countries and partners for 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 Russia. Uh, from the one hand, but uh, from the the other hand, I'm I'm I absolutely agree with uh, with Mark, and actually I have the same question for for how long Putin uh, can play can play this balancing role in the region, because of course now everybody is uh, in Russia is uh, is extremely happy that Netanyahu won the elections, but uh, from the other hand. From the other hand, uh, bets are high now, and risks uh, also are high now. And uh, actually, uh, it will be uh, much more problematic and complicated for uh, for Putin to balance between between Iran and Israel, between Iran and and and, and Gulf countries, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, yeah, from 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 this point of view, I guess, I guess. Uh, uh yeah that's i i also i also do not know for for how long uh putin will be able to to to, to balance him uh because before the ukrainian war it, it it was much more easy for 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 him now again uh, the situation is completely different thank you thank you uh we unfortunately we're going beyond this one hour time that we were supposed to to hold our meetings. Oh, I don't have time for the next round of um, questions, but definitely this extended uh, discussion was very interesting and was, it was worth it till the every minute. So um, I would like, first of all, to thank our guests and our speakers, uh, Dr. Roy Ellison, Dr. Marcos, Dr. Lenny Desai for a very interesting evening, for a very interesting discussion. I would like to thank uh, the Center for International and Regional Studies at Georgetown University uh, in Qatar for arranging this event and in more broad sense for actually launching this book project that ended up with the publication of our book and with today, uh, tonight discussion. And if you allow me, I received one last question from the audience asking where we, they can buy this book. So this book was published by uh, the Hearst Publishing House, um, which is based in London. And it also has University of Oxford Press logo, so it could be bought from them. Trust me, we are not receiving royalties, so it's absolutely as advert for the sake of the promotion of knowledge and our ideas and our views. And you're more than welcome to buy this book, read it, and return back to all of us with your questions. So thank you uh, all in the audience for this uh, evening, because I see that we had more than almost 40 guests at the beginning. Well, the numbers are stayed almost the seven till the very uh, the same till the very end. So thank you. That means that the meeting was really interesting and useful for all of us. And again, thank you very much to all of you for this discussion. I I, th I think we could call it a day. Thank you. Thank you.